I just came out with a new book, Flip It Like This. Oh, I saw that cartoon too. That's great. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a book of my best ofs. So I have over, oh, I have almost 5,000 cartoons in my arsenal. And the publisher asked if I could do a, a best ofs and get it down to about 130 cartoons. So that was really, really hard work. And oh. this just came out and it's under 20 bucks and you can get it anywhere books are sold. Welcome to Creative Ops, a podcast for creative people. I guess as good a place as any to start is, what was your calling both to art and, uh, you know, to the church, when did you, when did these, both of these things pop up as like a big part of your identity? Well, um, thanks, Chris. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on your show. And oh, yeah, I really love time. talking about creativity. Yeah. Uh, and it's an, it's a huge important part of my life. Like somebody asked me the other day, what came first, your art or pastoral ministry? I was like, well, definitely I was an artist first. And I became a, a pastor later. I've always been an artist. I haven't always been a pastor. So um, what's interesting about creativity and my spiritual journey is that my this kind of spiritual world I was in didn't really encourage the creative side, mm. the artistic side. Yeah. Um, so that I only found true liberty and freedom to express myself through my art after I left the ministry in the church. Hmm. So uh, I, I've been drawing ever since I can remember. I grew up in a home where my dad was an artist on the side. And um, so I've always drawn and always painted and all that kind of thing. And I well, then what was what was your earliest uh, what was your earliest pull beyond because you know, everybody yeah. starts with art in school and, but yeah. what, what was the first thing that you vividly remember being like, oh, I've got to make this on your own time? Was it painting? Was well, it just, drawing? Was it? Yeah, I just, I just remember as a kid, um, like my dad painted oils on board oh. um, on the side. He was a cop full time, but um he, oh, wow. he that's, would, a, that's a strange cross too police officer and painter on the weekend yeah. <laughs> that's true i never really thought of that but that's true um but i just remember i was i was a bit of a, a recluse i'm an infp on the you know myers-briggs um, personality type scale so i lean towards introversion anyway and um so I, I had a lot of alone time and, you know, uh, I, I just remember sitting down drawing pictures of animals or uh, painting a watercolor scene or whatever as a very small child. Just it, it, it was just in me, you know, um, it wasn't like I have to do this and I had to make myself create something. It was just kind of like breathing for me. Yeah. It was just and very was automatic. Too, so it was just very normal to be like, yeah, oh, this it was just very normal. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't weird or out of place or, you know, um, unique. It, it was just part of my, part of my household, seeing my dad paint and, and stuff like that. Do you so, think so that's genetic too, because I, across the, sp everyone on my wife's side of the family, specifically her mother's side of the family, every one of them can just pick up a brush and do a, 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 a water color. I'm like, how do you guys do that? They're like, I don't know. It's easy. Like, okay. <laughs> I, I imagine there's some genetics in it for sure. Um, my, like, like, so my, my father had been painting for many years, year, even before I was born. And I'm, I'm the first born of five kids. And so I, I watched him paint for a long time, you know, uh, He's still alive. He's in a nursing home now. But um, his mother, my grandmother, uh, after her husband died, took up painting mm. as a hobby. And she was in her 80s. And she was incredible. Yeah. And she never knew she could paint, you know, of her whole life. It wasn't until she was 80 years old, she discovered, oh, I can actually paint. So it, and, and uh, my mom, 
she never knew she could paint and she she does these watercolor landscapes now that are really beautiful so yeah I, I think genetics might be in it but I'll, I'll tell you what I personally think whether or not you have it in your family or in your genes or whatever I think anybody can become creative I in fact I think everybody has a creative potential within them and however you find a way to express that is up to you yeah and I think I've, I think I might have written something about that on a blog at one point in time but a lot of that's kind of the impetus for this show too because you know especially me as a writer uh -huh. when you're when you're not a writer or you haven't been formally trained in the writing process you look at somebody who writes a novel and you just like wow that must be some kind of magic but then you realize no yeah. it's just a lot of like does this work no does this work no does this work yes okay and the next yeah. one you know like and yeah then, it's uh, that's one of my dreams actually um I've, I've written 10 books so far they're all um non-fiction right uh that they're, they're some books are of my cartoons and things like that with words and so on but a lot of it's uh, uh, I, I I do have a dream one day of writing a novel, but I find it really kind of a daunting um, wish, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I, I see I see you are a writer. I know she just came out with a book called Switchers, or yeah, yeah, a little bit yeah. of science fiction, uh, time travel science fiction with a little bit of a horror element to it too. There's a like a oh, okay. zombie fungus that's killing everybody in the future, which is why everyone's trying to get to the past. But uh -huh. the adults, when they time travel to the past, they go into their kid bodies and the kids switch into the adult bodies. That's, That's a cool concept, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's one of the things I uh, aspire to one day. I would love to write a novel uh, that conveys some of the deeper thoughts I think about uh, in spirituality. Yeah. So... Um, um, rather than write just write another book on deconstruction or something like that, I would love to be able to write a really good story yeah. um, around that concept. So yeah, well, maybe I can bounce ideas off you uh, later too, because the thing I'm working on right now, the uh, the main antagonist is a rural cult leader in uh, in Michigan, and so I'm actually talking to somebody. I didn't talk to you because of this, <laughs> but I, I got somebody else coming on the show too who survived growing up in a cult and is going to talk about that wow um, but yeah and i part of what i'm doing in that is kind of dealing with uh kind of how i've been processing religion and spirituality in my life and putting that into kind of a novel form with a you know more fantastic storyline yeah yeah that's cool yeah because i good luck with that <laughs> how long has switchers been out by the way it came out uh in the beginning of june so yeah did you self-publish is it through amazon yeah yep and I, yeah i was actually shopping it around trying to get um a small press to publish it but then through this podcast i'd met enough people that were like hey man honestly especially with a debut novel you'll probably make more money uh yeah just doing it yourself and even if they signed you you'd still be doing all the work yourself i was like oh well, yeah. okay that's true you'd still do all the work i know that yeah. back it helps I've to have a podcast too because i can i can market through this but um yeah. Yeah, I've published, I've self-published eight and um, professionally published two. And it, they they both require the same amount of work, but I make more money off of my, the ones I sell, my, made, uh, publish myself. Yeah. 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 Because you're, you know, the Amazon royalty isn't, isn't as bad. A lot of times the publishers want like a clean 50-50 or even a 60-40 where you get the 40 and they get the 60. Plus they're like, oh, well, and there's still this. You know, you end up getting 18 cents a book at yeah. 80 cents uh, a book if you're it's, lucky. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of like musicians, you know, I, I know some professional musicians and they're on uh, Spotify and it's like, they might have millions of streams, but don't they only get literally pennies per play? Yeah, yeah. And like, like six and a half cents or something crazy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, takes yeah, a lot. There, there's obviously the musician world is a lot sexier than the than the writer world, but there's a lot of crossover in the and how that applies because somebody yeah. who's been on this show a couple times, um, a couple of members from the band Heartsick. It's a heavy heavy metal band from Lansing, Michigan. Okay, uh, their career as a band has really taken off. The more they've just been like, you know what, we don't need a label. We can do this ourselves. We can 
crowdfund money for an album. We can crowdfund money for a tour. We can save the money that we're making now that we're playing bigger shows. And yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a, it's a weird game. <laughs> it is, but that that's it in a, in a word, it's a game. Yeah. You, yeah. You got to figure out how to play it if you want to win. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you have to find a balance between being good at the business side, but then not losing the passion for why you did it in the first place. Cause I've I know. dialed it up to all business and all it is is, Oh, well, you know, I research trends and I write about what uh, other people are buying. And it's like, okay. I yep. Mean, it, it's good to know if no one's going to buy the thing that you're writing, like, okay, then maybe I'll put that on the back burner. But like, yeah, to be completely guided by business is, yeah. Which I'm sure you deal with that yourself because you, you well, sell your art now too, right? Like, yeah, you know, and, and between, I, well, I'm an artist and the artist mentality is like, man, I'd rather be broke and be free. And, but like, okay, yeah, yeah. we got to eat too. Yeah. Well, the artists I know, and I mean, creators of any kind, yeah, yeah. Uh, whether they're writers or painters or sculptors or dancers or poets or writer, whatever they are, mm. everyone that I know struggles with the the money the promotion the marketing the selling like uh and i i struggled with that a lot too throw in there the whole um my brand of christianity in the church was uh sort of a poverty mentality where mm. you know uh you, you needed to hate money or despise money or distrust money and you can't promote yourself you have to be humble um you know you can't get up on a soapbox and promote your material or talk or you know all that kind of thing and and money is the root of all evil and etc cetera, etc cetera, right so mm -hmm. you throw in that the artist sort of uh default position where you, you know money pollutes art um or and and you throw into that the whole um, you know, Christian idea that uh, money is evil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had a lot. I, I I had a lot of hangups to get over in order to get to the place where I can make a living off of my art. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine. <laughs> okay, I want to talk a little bit about the pastor stuff, and then I'm going to focus more heavily on the artistic stuff. But sure, it it all kind of stems one from the other, right? I, I guess in terms of. Um, the art that you're making now yeah. definitely comes from right i'm sorry about that man oh no that's fine um um the art that you're making now definitely comes from or at least is heavily informed by um i'm guessing your time in the church and involving the leaving the church can you tell me just a little bit give me kind of like the reader's mm -hmm. digest version of your um church career and then kind of what the impetus was to go you know what this isn't what uh what my true calling was yeah so as as a um a creative person like i've uh, i've been in music and art and all that kind of thing but yeah i, see the I, I the back. also yeah i i yeah that's right um i uh I, i'm also interested in spirituality as many artists are and um i ended up in seminary and ended up getting ordained and ended up in the ministry it's all you know I never felt like a child I'm going to be a pastor one day or a minister one day it, it just sort of you never felt like happened you and I touch where you're like I know no yeah. no burning bush experience for me <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I I just ended up there in, in the ministry and I I felt I did a good job of it and all that but uh, for me my my spiritual journey was one where I felt really really passionate about having the freedom to be my authentic self whatever that was including my spiritual self so I always found myself gravitating towards churches and so on that um, I felt that kind of freedom to to be my most authentic self it was in 2009 2010 when I started realizing the church could no longer really provide me with enough room to to grow and to be my most authentic self yeah. and uh you know me and the the church that i was pastoring at the time kind of came to a mutual uh agreement and we had a kind of an amicable divorce where i went my way and it went its way 
and well, you said, I hey, listen, I, we got to talk. And the other side was like, yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so I, I, I was just like, okay, so um, I'm my art has always been an expression of myself. You know, it's not like my spirituality was somewhere over here. And it expressed itself through religious means. Mm -hmm. My my spirituality is a part of my whole self, and it comes through in my art as well. And my art came through, my creativity came through in the way I pastored as well. It's all, you know, I, I don't see myself as a segmented kind of a divided person, that I'm a whole person. So my spirituality comes through my art, and my creativity comes through my spirituality, and so on and so forth. So... Mm -hmm. When I left the ministry in 2010, I decided, you know, um, I'm going to try and make this a full-time gig. And, um, you know, I went and taught at a university for a couple of years while I I built up, you know, the potential to make money online with my art and so on. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, 2012, I took the leap. And, you know, it's been growing ever since. I, I'm making a living from from my art and my writing and speaking and, and so on. So yes. I feel very fortunate. I feel very lucky. But I have also put a hell of a lot of work into it. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. There's That leads me into a question that just popped into my head because me and a friend were talking about this when I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to be talking to this guy who goes, on, uh, goes by Naked Pastor on Instagram. And I said, you know, I wonder how often he just misses that direct link because somebody had talked about, you know, the thing with becoming famous is the more people you touch, it's like you have a wider reach, but just not quite as deep of one with a person individually as you would with a smaller, you know, congregation where you're right. very much a big part of what what's going on in that person's life. Do you ever miss that smaller close connection whether it's pastoring or not that's one of the biggest uh pain points uh when people leave the church is that they miss the community aspect of their yeah. lives i saw your yeah. it, if anybody's listening go well <laughs> somebody's listening it, people who are listening go to uh at naked pastor on instagram look at his um reels because you've got one that specifically talks about that yeah i'm also on youtube where i have longer talks where i talk about this uh, the loss of community it's a it's a big deal so i miss that um in sort of intense intimacy one-on-one -on, not one-on-one -on -one, but like with with a community face to face yeah. with real people of and course the pandemic, feedback. you can see it on people's faces as soon as it's said it's you yeah got the reaction of course the pandemic exacerbated that reality for many people uh, just feeling isolated and separate and divided and, you know, um, alone. But in 2012, I also launched an online community called The Lasting Supper, um, where people um, pay to join this very small community of about 200 people and where we really interact a lot. And um, so th that sort of has helped. Uh, it's not the same as face to face, but it is a good um, fill in for sure. And I've made great friendships and relationships and it does feel like community. So there are those options as well for people, online communities that that actually can work. On the other hand, Lisa and I, my wife, Lisa and I have worked really hard at building friendships outside of, you know, and beyond the church and ministry. And, and so that's that's been an interesting journey as well. Yeah. yeah. Did you find yourself uh, getting holy ghosted? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of my cartoons you're making reference to there. Yeah. 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 Holy ghosted. Yeah. Where, um, you know, you leave and then, you know, these people who were your best friends are yeah. like vanished. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, tough. We've, we've, we've had a little bit of that too. Cause um, well, when I was <laughs> story time, when I was a little boy, uh, I went to a Catholic church, and a few years back, uh, our priest, who had just recently retired, made national headlines because he had been embezzling millions of dollars from the church for decades. And wow. they caught him because he moved into like a $5 million mansion that had like a 10,000 square foot pole barn. And yeah, 
had a full organ built inside of the house with stained glass window that he imported from Italy. Like, what are you doing? But um, I don't know. I, I feel like from a young age, I just always kind of looked at that guy and was like, something's not right here. I don't like this place. Um, but so I've always brought kind of this skepticism, whereas my wife is more like grew up Christian, went to all Christian schools, went to a Christian college, and then grew up and kind of was like, hmm, I'm not sure about all this. And people have either been like, well, we can't hang out or they'll be like, hey, let's hang out. And then the whole time they'll be talking about God or yeah. have Christian music playing on the radio. Like, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it's wow. not it's not a rejection of those people and it's not atheism either it's just a this this doesn't feel right you know and some people you know pick a, to go another cartoon they buy that theology box and then they're stuck in it for the rest of their life yeah and and part of that theology is that they must convert other people yeah. and you know yeah. and so yeah i i have empathy for those people i used to be there yeah where if you really, really loved people, you don't want them to go to hell. You want them to go to heaven. And so you yeah. really have to convert them. And and it, it, it all comes as a part of the package. Yeah. And um, of course, it's not enough to say, you know, it's kind of rude to keep pressuring me to convert. Uh, it's deeper than that, where they have to uh, change their minds and um, uh, abandon theology of... I'm I'm in and you're out and I need to get you in kind of thing. It's yeah. it's tough. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, <laughs> and then being at being at the uh, you know at the epicenter of that within a church community because I don't know if you know much about West Michigan, but it's within the within the Midwest. It's particularly Bible thumpy. Um, well, that's where Calvin College is and all. Yeah, that's where my wife went. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Calvin University now. Um, Calvin University. I I I was a guest speaker there a few years ago. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, that's that's funny because that's actually, at a conference just just before uh, we went on here. I was talking about my son does uh, vision therapy and he does it just just down the road from there. Oh okay. <laughs> Go past there all the time. Um, yeah, you could. I could. I could feel Calvin in the air, and I know Calvin because I. I was um, ordained as a Presbyterian minister, which is Calvinist, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just not as extreme. They didn't go as far as to name it. <laughs> name it yeah. Calvinism. Um, well, now they call it. My wife goes to the CRC church or went, grew up the Christian Reformed Church. But the thing that I don't right. understand, especially in West Michigan, is you'll see a church build up, build up, build up, and then split and start. An, it's almost like uh, it's almost like stocks. You know what I mean? Yeah. it builds up builds up and then there's a merger and then or two two keep shrinking and then they merge together um yeah i know, I know. but the 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 idea that people split so much over doctrine when the uh the ultimate thing is jesus said hey let's let's love everybody and they're like well yeah but how did he mean that well i disagree with you you know what i can't worship with you anymore seems seems very bizarre yeah oh i know i know i've been there done that yeah. I've been a part of a church split. I mean, uh, I, I I was pastoring a church where it split right down the middle. And uh, it was devastating. I've seen churches uh, split and heard of churches splitting over things like uh, we want more modern music or um, yeah. we want to have people uh, do interpretive dance while the band is playing. And other people are like, what? No, get out of here. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> why can't people just do the interpretive dance if they want to do the interpretive dance? Um, but yeah. <laughs> That people get the their very specific ways about things should be. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So then let's move on from when you decide to uh to split and make art full time. What's yeah. uh what's kind of your first move? Do you do you have like a business plan? Do you have, you know, in a year from now I want to be doing this. Three years from now, or is it all just like I think this I think this is gonna work. Fingers crossed. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I um have a lot to say about that. Um in fact, uh I'm I'm creating a course on on this very kind of a thing where Ooh. um and I hope to get it up on my YouTube channel soon, but just about the whole creative thing and turning it into 
a business. Yeah, because everybody wants to tell you right away when people are going to go turning creativity into a business. Yuck! <laughs> you've compromised your soul. You've sold your soul to the devil. You know. Yeah. Um, but that's if you want to be an artist full time, you've got to sell your art. And I'll tell you, I started selling my art on eBay back in 2000 and I don't know. No, maybe it was before that, before the year 2000. I started selling my art on eBay. Hmm. And so 23 years later, man, 23 years later, I'm I'm now making a living. It, I think my number one um, positive quality towards all this is that I just don't go away. I just keep showing up. I just keep yeah. doing it. And, you know, you just have to, you have to keep creating and you keep have, have to keep promoting and talking about it and sharing it. Uh, that's how, you know, the other, the other thing is just to keep creating stuff and hope some fairy godmother will show up and offer to show your stuff to the world and, you know, like winning the lottery, but that, that just doesn't happen very often, if at all, you know, it can happen in small so, scale though. Like I was thinking, uh, while you were saying that a friend of mine who I met through the podcast, his name is Mike Logan. He's a fantastic comedian. Um, one day he called me up and he was like, hey, man, um, I just talked to uh, somebody I know and you're going to be on TV talking about your book. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, I've just been watching you hustle for the last couple of months and I was impressed. And I was like, oh, this guy deserves a break. So he got me on like a local segment, you know, like a three minute segment on the local news. That's cool, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, things like that do happen. But notice you are already putting in the work. Yeah. But it starts with putting in that work first. Like, isn't there a saying, something like that, that luck shows up to those who are prepared? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just saw another one the other day. I wish I could remember who said it because it was it was a good person who had said it too. But it was something like, the funny thing about luck is the harder I work, the more lucky I get. That's right. That's exactly that's exactly true. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I just read um, Cormac McCarthy's new book, The Passenger. Ooh. Uh, and uh, I, I was reading about Cormac McCarthy. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, uh, for those who don't know who Cormac McCarthy is, he wrote No Country for Old Men, The Road, yeah. uh, All the Pretty Horses, etc. And he'd been writing for 27 years before All the Pretty Horses got noticed and then it became a film and, and now he's in demand. Yeah. But he'd been silently, quietly writing away, publishing his books, trying to get things out there, trying to get the word out. Um, and and that, you know what, often, most often, that's what it takes is that kind of slogging away at it day after day after day and keep painting. You know, I've got, you know, I've got my own paintings all over the wall here. They're not sold yet, but one day they'll sell. Yeah. So I, I just keep painting. Somebody told me yesterday that Lizzo, um, who won record of the year this year, the Grammys, um, she had already, and it was one song that that really made that record win, which is I'll Never, I'll Never Give Up or something. I can't remember the title of the song. Anyway, she had written two, something like 232 songs, written and produced, recorded, demoed with the band, everything. 232 songs before this record became record of the year. She's made it now, right? Um, but all that work that she put into it. And so that that's what I tell artists and creators of any kind is, is just to keep, keep on doing it. If you're, if you're passionate about it and you love doing it, you'll, you'll love doing it. Yeah. Um, and it's not like work, but you got to keep doing it and keep putting it out there and figuring out ways to get it out there. Yeah. yeah yeah and that's that's a nice thing with uh starting a podcast if anybody out there wants to start a podcast is you can actually see those results like the first year the line just kind of goes mm, the second year yeah. and it goes like mm, and then the third year it just starts, <laughs> and it just you know like a roller coaster just goes whoosh. there you go it's all about yeah showing up every week or close to every week and uh <laughs> just well, that's what Woody Allen with said. something, whether people like it or not, they're like, oh, here comes this thing again. And then they're just, you know, it's like uh, uh, 
Oh, the the dog the dog experiment. You ring the bell and then the dog starts to salivate because it just expects the treat, Pavlov. you know? Yeah, yeah. Pavlov. Pavlov. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like Woody Allen. What well, I don't know what you think of Woody Allen, but but he said 90% of it is showing up. And yeah. and it's really, really true. Like 90% of it is just showing up every day. Yeah. And doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. The, la the last one of those quotes I'll piggyback on here was uh Bill Burr said. If you do anything long enough, somebody's going to give you an award. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been, I've been, uh, I left the ministry in 2010. It's 13 years ago, and um, I, you know, I'm, I'm making a living at it. I'm not rolling in the money, but I mean, I, I'm able to support a lifestyle that I'm happy with and my wife's happy with. She's a full-time nurse as well, which doesn't hurt. But um, yeah, my wife's a nurse. so it, it, it all works together, but you got to put in the work. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind me asking what kind of nursing you said? You said your wife's a nurse, right? Yes. What kind of nursing does she do? Well, when we left the ministry, um, I say we because we were really in it together. She decided to, uh, our kids had left home empty nest. Uh, we'd lost all our friends. She thought, well, I'm going to do something with my time. Nice. 48 years old, she went to university and got her nursing degree. Nice. And uh, so five years later, she graduated with a specialty in uh, palliative care. And so now she works in a palliative care home. Oh, wow. Full time. Yeah. Big heart that lady must have. She does. Yeah, she's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, her being a nurse and making an income has has helped. Yeah. But we're actually at the point now where we can say, you know, at some someday um, soon, hopefully, if she wants, she it, hopefully I'm making enough that she can retire and we can do what we want. We can travel and go visit our kids who are spread all over the place. Yeah. And um, or whatever, you know, uh, she loves her job, though, and is not sure she wants to do that yet. But uh, <laughs> to have that option is is really nice. Yeah, um, I keep telling my wife, once all our kids are out of the house, then uh, sell our place, start travel nursing, and I'll just write and podcast from wherever we're. Wherever oh, we're your going. wife's a nurse as well. Yeah. Yeah. She oh, does, cool. Uh, she does pack you now, but she started in the ICU for like almost a decade, I think. Wow, that's intense. Yeah, yeah, literally. Excuse the pun. Excuse the pun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my wife worked in, uh, she did a little bit of um, post op operative, uh, post op stuff. Yeah, yeah uh, that's the same thing as PACU. That's what my wife does now. Really intense. Ugh. Anyway, I don't know how she does it, but, but now she helps people die well. So uh, it's quite a gift. Which yeah. is, which is important. People need that. Yeah. There's actually um, two, two stores in grand rapids that sell my book and one of them is called the mortals cafe and it's a coffee place that specializes in a lot of vietnamese coffees and their theme is death so they just want to like encourage people to talk about it openly and in a healthy way and they have like monthly grief groups that come in and talk and yeah. wow just to remove the taboo around death which the more you think about death which i'm sure your wife has to a lot um you kind of hope like, man, that's a, that's a very uh, vulnerable, important yeah. time in a person's life. And you kind of hope somebody yeah. is going to be there for you that cares, you know? They must sell a lot of dark roasts. That's a bad pun. Bad pun. <laughs> bad pun. I like it. I like bad puns. I'm a father of four, so I uh, bring them on. <laughs> oh, I love a good dad joke, man. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my kids... The best thing is when you tell a joke like that and your kids go, that's not funny. And then you see them turn around, biting their lips, trying not to smile. Yeah. yeah. I live for that now because my I've got two kids. One's, one's 21, another one's 14. And they're both in that wow. zone of like, my parents can't be cool. Yeah. <laughs> they can't be cool. And they're, they probably don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Our kids are 35, 33, and 30. So, okay. yeah. So they're... They're seeing you as human beings again and respecting you probably a little more. They're our best friends. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're all best friends. Like we travel together. We're going to we're going to Burning Man together this year. All five oh, wow. of us. <laughs> so uh, bring a yeah, lot of water. 
our kids have been there before several times, but uh, they've talked us and Lisa and I into going this year. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> are you going to set up a booth there or are you just going there for fun? Well, they've asked, I've been asked to apply to be, uh, to provide a talk. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. If I do provide a talk, I'll be there to give a, give a talk. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So that'd be cool. Okay. But I'm not, I'm, I, my name's Naked Pastor only because I'm vulnerable, open, honest, real. I'm not literally naked, as you can see. Um, how, many, how many times do people- literally naked there either. <laughs> how many times do people ask you like, yeah, man, I had, I was telling somebody about you and I had to be like, no, 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 he doesn't get naked though. <laughs> almost every day. Yeah. <laughs> almost every day I have to explain. <laughs> almost every day. I, you know, I, when I first got Naked Pastor, it was totally an accident. I was informed that I'd won an auction. Uh, it, it, it was back when Naked Chef and Naked Archaeologist and Naked Truth, all those shows were kind of cool. Yeah. And I thought, well, Naked Pastor would be kind of cool. And I entered my name in, and I didn't know I was entering a auction for the name nakedpastor.com. And when I got a notice, you won the auction. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> Wonder how. And it was only like 70 bucks or something. So nobody else wanted it. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I got the name. And I, there's been many times I've wondered, was that very smart? Because... Some people can't access it in libraries or schools or whatever because of the word get in there. And, and <laughs> I never thought like, about that. Yeah. Or you're, are you a pervert or, you know, are you a child molester or a pedo or whatever because of naked pastor, naked priest, you know, all this kind of stuff conjures yeah. up all kinds of images. So yeah, it's, it's a problematic name, but at the same time, people all around the world have heard of it. <laughs> so yeah. we'll tell a lot of that. <laughs> To a lot of those, I would say, you know, the same thing. Uh, was it D. Snyder from Twisted Sister talking about Al Gore's wife? Is like, listen, if you're looking for sexual explicit stuff and everything, you'll find it no matter what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I'm sure I yeah. butchered that quote, but yeah, something to that effect. Yeah. No, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what is, uh, what's, uh, I'm kind of curious about how your business model has evolved. Like you said that you started selling things on eBay, but then right. um, what uh, what was kind of the evolution of, oh, you know, I'm going to sell things at eBay. Then all of a sudden, probably Facebook became, I'm trying to remember when Facebook became a really big thing. I think around 2010, 2009, 2008, somewhere there. Something like that. So then did social media have a, a big change in the way that you sold things and marketed things too? Well, uh, um, I think there was a couple of elements that kind of made a perfect storm, uh, a congruence of, of different things. So eBay um, be, started getting nicknamed Feebay because it was, their, their fees were going up and up and up and it was uh -huh. becoming more, more expensive. So um, at, about that time, Etsy came out, mm. which, which is an online um, platform where you can sell your art and so on. And so I tried out Etsy and lo and behold, my art was taken up. I, I really didn't like the auction kind of, even though you could set a price and everything, the auction format of eBay uh, was a little bit too scary. And sometimes I felt like I got ripped off. Well, I did. <laughs> so um etsy you set your price and you sell your art your prints and so on and um it, you know i started making money um and then at the same time um like facebook started you know and then there was twitter and then instagram and now tiktok and you know linkedin and all those things i i just i just went on everything and started sharing my work right out across everywhere yeah. the cool thing about um my cartoons is it's one thing they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And I really do believe that's true because mm. I could write a thousand word blog post and people would could like skim it over or, or, you know, scroll past or get angry and leave or whatever. Whereas with my cartoons they are often one frame and you, it's a split second. You see it, you can't unsee it. It's yeah. done. The work is done in a split second. And so I found people there it's they're quickly absorbable. Uh, you can quickly share it. Um, you know, and, and my cartoons started going viral and, uh, which, which is kind of cool. Like, I mean, 
I do a lot how, of the work. How long had you been putting them out before you started to see like, whoa, a lot of people are looking at these? Um, I started cartooning in about 2005. And I think um, it was around 2009 when uh, they started getting noticed. Okay, so it wasn't it wasn't an getting... overnight success. No, it wasn't an overnight, but it's kind of like the hockey stick um, where things go along and then yeah. whoop, just like you said with your podcast traffic. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's the same kind of thing where, you know, un up until about 2009, I was kind of flying underneath the radar. My, not even my own congregation read my blog or looked at my cartoons. They're like, oh, we have to listen to you every week. Why should we read your blog kind of thing? And then um, it, I, it was around 2009 when my cartoons really started taking off and people started to notice locally. And people were starting to notice in Canada, which is where I live. Yeah. And and then the denomination where I was a part of started noticing and I started getting calls from head office and letters of concern and they were getting letters of concern. And and that's when I knew my time was up, actually, in 2009. Yeah. And w it was within a year that I was I, gone. I was going to say, I can f just just in you saying that I could feel almost kind of like this, this mental grading of people being like, hey, listen, if you're going to do this kind of thing then blah 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 and you kind of being like well listen if i'm going to yeah. do this kind of thing then no 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 <laughs> well i was actually advised to run my material through them first uh -huh. and i knew no this isn't uh, this how do you feel good. about church censorship sir <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean they meant well they meant well yeah and uh, we're trying to protect me i suppose and protect the church yeah. but my number one drive is my own personal freedom to be my authentic self. And so that was like, no, this just isn't going to work. And yeah. I knew my time was up. And and within a year, I submitted my resignation. I was gone. Hmm. Yeah. Just like that. Overnight. And yeah. Do you still have some connections with people? Or was it a pretty solid like, well, if you're going on that path, you're going on that path alone, buddy. Pretty much, pretty much. There's a few people that um, we have reconnected with um, and it did require reconnecting. Yeah. Uh, but there, there's a few couples that we've reconnected with and we, we consider them friends and they consider us friends and we get together now and then. That's nice. And so that's good. But generally speaking, the church overall, it went its way and I went my way. And mm. um, yeah, yeah pretty 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 severe yeah. but that's the way that's the way it, it, it usually goes you know um the, a lot of the people i know it's never like yeah i just stopped going to church but i'm still friends with everybody that's very rare it's usually uh if you're not a part of our um herd then you know you're a threat or yeah. whatever and uh you know you can't play so um we had to figure out, Lisa and I had to figure out how to survive out in the world without this thing we called church that we'd been a part of for our whole lives, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the that's the nice thing about the art though, is you can you can pour it all into that. Plus, with the the audience that you've gained, going back to that sense of community. Right. You must have a you must have a pretty strong sense of community because what is it on Instagram? You're you're in the six digits on on followers on there, right? Yeah, I'm about I'm I'm at about 119,000. So, congratulations. Today. Um, yeah. So yeah, then there there must be a sense of community in there, right? You see, oh yeah, lots of comments for sure. But then you'll see the same people commenting or sharing or yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, it's at, at that point though. Does that my Instagram? My Instagram, I work really hard at keeping it. I was going to say, though, with that many followers, does that in itself almost become kind of burdensome because you you have to spend time thinking about what you're going to put on there, but then also the interaction. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Some people do post things, and then that's that's it. <laughs> no interaction. But you you don't strike me as the guy that's just I don't like, know. I, I could care less. No, I, re I read every comment. Or I my daughter helps me. Um yeah. 
she she uh, makes sure I don't miss anything. Yeah. And um and but I respond to all the messages and DMs and emails and everything. It it takes a lot of work, but because uh, I I do care about the the people out there. I do know I do know people, artists included, who just post and just let whatever flies fly, and yeah. they don't they don't respond or anything, which is fine. That's their way of doing things. But me, um, I I love the interaction and the community aspect. And Instagram is probably my most dynamic and safest um, feeling community out there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is something about the way that Instagram works. I like it the most myself, um, huh. even though it's strange. I, I put the most effort into that one, but I feel like Facebook still gives uh, sends more people to my um, away from the app and to my website. And I've heard oh, okay. other people say that that's not the case with them at all, that Instagram has been great for their business side. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I haven't <laughs> I haven't unlocked that door yet. <laughs> yeah I you know what I don't understand it and I don't pretend to understand it and I don't even think I'm going to try to understand it I mean uh, yeah. there, are, there are people who I I have who help me on the marketing end of things and the social media platform end of things who know it a lot better than I do and algorithms and all that stuff and they try to keep up if I tried to keep up with all that stuff I just wouldn't have time to create yeah and, and interact with people so um, that's one of the benefits of making a little bit of money with your art is you can pay people to um, do things for you. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's one of the things I do pay for is people to help me on my social media. Yeah, that's cool it. too that your creativity is now writing checks for other people. Yeah, yeah. I you know what? I never would have dreamed in a, I never would have dreamed I'd, I'd get to this place where I'm 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 paying people to help me and yeah. um, like it's I never would have dreamed I could have done this with my art but here we are so but, let's yeah go ahead well I was gonna say um, I don't want to keep you on a whole lot longer I think we got another 10-15 minutes before the hour I committed you to is up but um, yeah, sure. talking specifically about the art what mm. uh what kind of is your daily weekly routine do you wake up in the morning have a pot of coffee and get right to painting something right to cartooning something how many days a week do you work that kind of thing yeah so it's taken me a long time to figure out a kind of a routine that's best for me um I, and what i've discovered is i get up pretty early and uh the first thing I do is I, um, you know, let the dog out, fill her bowls. I put the coffee on. Um, I this morning I stoked the fire in the wood stove, um, and then I I I don't put my music on yet or anything. I sit down and I read something kind of contemplative, um, and then I write in my journal and I just spend some quiet time. I like to start my day that way because it sort of sets the tone. Mm -hmm. uh, I I need to live a kind of a Zen like life. Yeah, that's how I'm. I've discovered I I'm at my best when I'm Zen. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I hope people understand what I mean that by that. I mean just calm, peaceful, present in my body and so on. And then um, Lisa, she'll probably be getting up and you know we'll have a coffee together and we'll talk and and so on and then i i go do my breathing exercises uh, meditation uh and then i and then i get to work with um getting a cartoon ready for nine o'clock and um i do that and then i do my exercises like i i go for a run or then i do my push-ups and my pull-ups and all that kind of stuff and then I, I get to work with painting or or writing or, you know, all this stuff the, the rest of my day um, yeah. until Sunday. And then um, Lisa and I try to spend the evenings together and I check in on my social media now and then. But generally speaking, that's how my day goes. And it's pretty much every day, Monday to Sunday. 
Um, but I, the weekends are a lot less busy. I maybe won't post as much because I post several times a day. So mm -hmm. I post at nine o'clock. I post at one o'clock. I post at four o'clock. I post at eight o'clock. And, uh, you know, with my different things, I've got so many things going on. Like I have my, I don't only have my cartoons. I have my writing. I have my videos. I have my paintings. I have sculptures. I've got, you know, all kinds of stuff going on. So I, I'm trying my hardest to get all that stuff out there. And, and um, well, yeah. I'm just curious with, with a workflow like that, is it pretty loose? Like, do you take time to kind of just sit there and let your mind blank? Or are you like, nope, I got to do this. I got to do this. Once that's done, moving right into the next thing. Are you the kind of person that, you know, yep. just keeps going that whole time? Or do you take a little bit of non-time to just kind of let your mind settle and go where it's going to go? Or Yeah. So like I said, I start my day with like breathing exercises, mm -hmm. writing in my journal contemplation meditation uh and then i find uh, you know and i put my music on and so on but um spotify and yeah. stream but um what what i find is i need to be still and just be sitting there with no noise nothing just dreaming up ideas for my cartoons mm -hmm. and um that's how i'm most productive is is when i'm just sitting there looking into space yeah. And, um, and, and just letting images come to my mind. Yeah. Um, my painting though, um, my, my, my drafting tables right here where I do my painting and, um, I, I get it all set up and I, I approach it very Zen and I just start painting. I don't have a plan. I just start painting and, mm -hmm. and see what happens. And, um, so my, my paintings tend to be very kind of Zen like as well. And uh, so space and silence and calm and being present um, and being optimistic, happy, all those things help to help, help me be creative. You yeah. Know? yeah. 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 Because I, I find myself, I guess I, I wrote about it a little bit in a blog, the idea of non-time where you're devoted to creativity but you're not necessarily like i have to be productive but just like just kind of sitting there and yeah letting your mind still letting letting what's going to come to it come to it rather than you know if i just keep writing eventually i'll hit that idea and now i got something you know so <laughs> i didn't know if you were more of a like as long as i'm working i'll keep finding my flow or if you were more of a hold on it'll come kind of guy yeah yeah well, um, yeah, there's some important research out there showing that um, I, I just finished a book by Johan Hari called Stolen Focus, where we've we've lost, we're losing, and many of us have lost the ability to focus for any length of time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I read another book that really changed my life too, called Deep Work, um, where we need to spend like we need to block off time where we're not interrupted by anything yeah. and we can focus on something for a, a long amount of time, like an hour and a half, two hours, three hours. And I, I try it. I try it. And it's amazing what you can get done. It's amazing mm -hmm. what you can create, but yeah. too many of us have our screens on our phones nearby. We get distracted by notifications where, you know, phone call texts, you know, um, our curiosity, oh, I wonder if this is on Amazon, you know, all this kind of, like <laughs> yeah, if we yeah. could just totally block away uh, like three hours a day where there's no interruptions. Yeah. It's really amazing the kind of deep work that can get done during that time and creativity. Yeah. That's why I think it might be maybe 50, 50, just that uh -huh. most of the things that I write, I'll start with a pad and a, a pen first yeah even even when i'm writing a novel it's the stupidest way to do it i'll write everything on a yellow pad then i'll type it onto the computer kind of fixing things up here and there as i go but um yeah um, have you seen those um uh oh shoot what are they called it's on my facebook timeline all the time advertisement uh, they must know i want one because they keep showing me but it's uh it's a keyboard where you can type into yeah 
There's no one other writer who has one of those. Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, there's no internet. Yeah. It's just a typewriter where it types into a, and then I, I think then you can upload it to somewhere. Yeah. But yeah, my buddy yeah. Joshua Marcella has one of those and I think he can, yeah, plug it into his computer and then it'll upload the last however many thousand words that he typed out. Who's that? Joshua Marcella. He's a writer oh. in Maine, horror writer. Oh, okay. The other horror writer from Maine. <laughs> yeah, Stephen King. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I hope, uh, how's Swi Switcher's doing? Not bad. I've sold a couple hundred copies of it. So for a self-published debut, I'm, I'm being told by other writers that it's it's good numbers. But it's not uh, New York to Times bestseller numbers. Yeah, you got to be up in the thousands for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And within the first two weeks or something, the publication. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but the same thing, too, like you said, with the hockey stick, I, uh, as far as career goals go, I, I have hopefully realistic expectations that each one will just kind of, you know, build on to the next one. So, um, yeah. Is, is yeah. Assuming the next one's as good as the first one or better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then and then people can go back into the archives and get your older work as well. Yeah, but I've talked to a, a few self-published writers who said, yeah, you know, once you've got four, five, six books out, then you can actually start making enough money to like supplement things and start thinking about, um, you know, cutting back on work or not working. But I've I've not been working because my wife's been nursing and then I got uh, four kids, a couple of them younger now. I could go back to work, but uh, kind of a lot of interesting things going on that we just kind of, both of us, my wife and I, she's like, you know, you could go to work now, but it just seems like you keep finding these interesting opportunities. Keep riding this out. Let's see where it goes. So, Oh, wow. That's that's great. Yeah. So anybody out there who's like, why don't you go to work, you lazy bum, <laughs> make, your wife make all the money. <laughs> it's yeah. as much her idea as it's mine. Yeah. Well, you know what? I hope to, um, you know, share the the blessing with Lisa. Like she she worked while I went to seminary. Yeah. And um, and and then you know we worked together all through our marriage and so on. And then um, she's a nurse now, and that really helped. Her income really helped me get on my feet as an artist. Yeah. And now we're able to talk about you know. I think we could make it without your income and mm -hmm. uh, you know, we could travel and stuff. She's like, yeah, yeah. Let's just wait a little longer. She loves her job. And yeah. And uh, yeah. Nurses, know, man. They, I think, the, yeah. I was in the military. So <laughs> oh, okay. before people go like, Hey man, don't talk about the military. There's a real close bond. People get in the military. Like even people that I didn't like that I served with, I would like, yeah. you know, I would step if they got in a fight in a bar fight, I'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'd try to at least stop them from getting beat up. Um, nurses seem like they have that same thing. Like my wife left one job and she was like, you know what? I was super ready to leave the organization, but I cried every time one of the people I worked with said goodbye to me. Yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah you go through stuff with uh, with people, especially I'm sure in that branch of nursing. Yeah, I mean, Lisa met with a, a nurse she studied with uh, yesterday, and then she's meeting with another nurse today for lunch. So it's yeah. like, it's quite a, a a club, for sure. Yeah. Nursing, it's it's as much a lifestyle as it is a career. There's, there's a couple of, uh, actually, there's maybe one pastor that I might meet with, but that's about it. Or no, there's a couple pastors I, I meet with, ex-pastors. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, ex pastors are really interesting people. I uh, I actually interviewed interviewed a guy who used to be a pastor, and he he either got fired or quit. I can't remember now, but um, he was very you know well. I got to be careful what I say and how I say things. And now he's like, oh, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's my problem. Is I I I kind of. I kind of uh, brought it on, you know, my blog and everything and my cartoons and everything kind of brought it on. And, but that's just the way I am. Like, I, I know a lot of people who are in the ministry who ride that line between being authentic and being offensive. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a hard line to navigate. Um, so I, I didn't do so well there uh, at toward the end. I, 
I, I felt I needed to be more authentic than I needed to be less offensive. So yeah, well, that's um, just a good sign that you out outgrew that, uh, you know, part of your life, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But listen, I am jealous though, that you wrote a novel. I I've got to figure out how to do that. I'm jealous too. Cause I have to repeat it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, did you, did you take writing courses or coaching yeah. or? Yeah. I was, like I said, I was in the military and then, uh, after the military, I used my, uh, GI bill and went to uh, community college first and then to Aquinas College, a small school here in Grand Rapids. And I had mm -hmm. a English literature degree with a concentration in creative writing, a couple creative writing classes and a teaching creative writing class too. Oh, wow. And then I taught wow. English in middle school for five years before my wife and I actually realized, we're like, you know, after paying for all these child care bills and everything, you're basically bringing home like a couple hundred dollars a month. Like, yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah. <laughs> For all the work, all the reading kids' papers, all the lesson planning, all the going to after school events so that kids know that you actually care. Cause, you know, just showing up at those things, even if you're like, I don't really want to watch a middle school basketball game, but, you know, I'm here <laughs> for the kids. It just, yeah. it was a lot of time away from home, especially when you're thinking about not making hardly any money doing it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So. yeah. Cool, man. Yeah. Well, um, if there's anything you want to say uh, to people listening about where they can find you, and I'll make sure that it all gets in the show notes, I guess now's the appropriate time to do that. Yeah. Oh, I should show you something here. Just one sec. Mm. Thanks for asking. But yeah. uh, I just came out with a new book. Flip it like this. Oh, I saw that cartoon too. That's great. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, it's a book of my best ofs. So I have over, okay. I have almost five thousand cartoons in my arsenal, and the publisher asked if I could do a, a best ofs and get it down to about one hundred and thirty cartoons. So that was really really hard work, and okay. this just came out, and it's under twenty bucks, and you can get it anywhere books are sold. But uh, oh, nice. it's a lot of fun and uh there's a written introduction but the rest are just cartoons and people are really enjoying that book but you can find me at nakedpastor.com and i'm naked pastor all across all the social media platforms so i'm really good at responding as well if you reach out and say hey i saw you on chris's podcast and uh you said i could reach out and um yeah i'm here for you yeah you got back to me very fast too thank you for that by the way it was um it was fun talking to you and I'm kind of Thanks. sad that my I've, I've constrained the show to try to be like an hour or less just because, you know, listening habits yeah. because yeah. Uh, I, I, I could talk to you <laughs> a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, we uh, can. Yeah. Yeah. We can. Yeah. We can always run it back again. Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, just kidding. They like us. We can light it up.
Yeah, man. Yeah, 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 man. Weird, right?